they want to know who I am and who who who's taking care of them for their back pain. So I did my a uh, little bit about my uh, background. I did my undergraduate studies at the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, a pretty scenic backdrop to do my schooling. I actually started um, studying engineering and finished uh, with a degree in exercise physiology once I decided I wanted to go and move towards a medical profession. Uh, from there, I moved to Philadelphia and I got a master's in medical science at Drexel University College of Medicine and ended up staying there for medical school as well. I got my uh, MD there. And uh, those of you who know um, Philadelphia and the healthcare system there, Hahnemann Hospital has actually been around for quite some time. Uh, it's gone through a number of name changes throughout the years. Originally, the, the first women's college of Pennsylvania um, who helped kind of produce the first uh, female doctors in the United States. But recently it went out of business and uh, a real estate company in California sold them and is planning on turning it into apartment buildings. So I like to call it now the, uh, the medical school formerly known as Drexel Medical School. Um, then I went and moved to California, which is actually where I'm from. And I completed my residency in orthopedic surgery. I rotated at a number of hospitals, including Harbor UCLA, which is a uh, one of the main trauma centers taking care of the southern part of Los Angeles County. I also went to several of the Kaiser Permanente hospitals. I, I worked at one of the UCLA facilities in Santa Monica, Children's Hospital and Rancho Los Amigos Rehabilitation Center. Here's a picture of me uh, performing a hip surgery with a few of my colleagues and my program director. Um, and so I do have a pretty extensive training in general orthopedic surgery and fracture care as well. And it is one of my uh, um, demographics of people that I do take care of. Um, following that, I moved to Boston to complete my fellowship in spine surgery, where I spent a year focusing on the spine. Uh, during my training, I was at uh, Mass General and the Brigham, uh, which is the Harvard Combined Spine Program. And here you can see a picture of uh, my colleagues, my co-fellows and my mentors at the bottom. Um, and uh, kind of led me to uh, my job here over at Plymouth Bay Orthopedics as we are a, a multi-specialty orthopedic service, um, taking care of problems in the uh, shoulder, elbow, hand, spine, knee, hip, you name it, we can help you with it. We also have uh, uh, two uh, physicians who specialize in non-operative management of these problems. And so I think we're a pretty comprehensive uh, orthopedic care center. And part of really one of the reasons why I uh, focused on settling here is, is my long-term career. Um, and so many people ask me, uh, you know, you're from California, Dr. Beck, why the heck would you move out to uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts? You know, there's a lot of good things that I enjoyed out in California. I had, I had the waves and surfing. I enjoyed bike riding. You can see I live near the beach there. And then I'm, I'm a pretty de devoted, devote uh, Dodger fan. And so it's hard to be away from home with that. Um, but when you think about it, there's really a lot of similarities between uh, Los Angeles and Boston. My Dodgers have a few of the old Boston players. Uh, and surfing does exist here on the East Coast as well. It's just a little bit change of scenery, <laughs> change in weather. And so nothing that I can't get used to. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, but when it comes down to it, it's really my family that brought me out here. Um, my wife's family is in the in New England area. And so um, that really has to uh, draw us out here. But I'm very happy in the area. And you can see that some things uh, won't really change with my uh, Los Angeles heritage. Uh, so let's get to the talk now. Back pain, here's kind of an overview of all the things that I'm going to be talking about. What is lower back pain? We'll talk about how I define back pain. We'll talk about the physiology or the pathophysiology. Where does this pain come from? And then we'll talk about the diagnosis. Um, what do people complain of? What are things I'm looking for in my exam? What kind of imaging do I use in the diagnostics as I try to help diagnose back pain and kind of figure out where the back pain is coming from? Then we'll talk about the treatment of lower back pain. Um, we'll talk about conservative care. And then spine surgery, is there a role for surgery in the treatment of back pain? And who, who's really a candidate for surgery in, when you have back pain? So back pain, where's the pain coming from? And that's the million dollar question that I even have a hard time to grasp. There are a lot of different pain generators in the back. Um, there's a lot of different structures that can actually um, cause pain. So the discs can cause pain, the bones can cause pain within the vertebral bodies, the facet joints, the nerves, the muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, the fascia. Is this something inherent to the spinal column itself? 
or is it referred from the musculature surrounding the spine? Um, and it's really a hard thing for me as a, uh, a practitioner to um, tease out in, um, and everything. Um, so back pain is a very common um, thing for people to come into the doctor for. 50% of working Americans uh, report back pain each year. Back pain is the second most common reason why people go to see a doctor, only, only behind symptoms of a common cold, so sneezes and coughs. Back pain is the second most common reason people go to see a doctor of any kind. And so what that accounts to is that 80% of the US population will experience back pain at some point in their lives, 80%. So that's a pretty high number. It's pretty significant. And just to put that into um, relation for everybody, um, only 61% of Americans own a smartphone. So you think that everyone that you know owns a smartphone, but it's only 61%. Only 68% of Americans have seen at least one Star Wars film, and there's like nine of them now. So it's pretty impossible to think that people haven't seen a Star Wars film. 80% of Americans have home internet access. And 80% of Americans live within 20 miles of Starbucks. And that could actually bring you to a pretty interesting circumstance. When I was in Boston, I was actually sitting at one Starbucks and I could see across the street, there's another Starbucks. And so Starbucks are everywhere. Um, and then, you know, of course they try to order your drinks and they always find interesting ways to write your name on the drink. So back pain, I, I like to refer to as axial back pain, meaning the, the center of your spinal column coming from the spine itself. Um, it's pain due to advanced degeneration of uh, materials that help support the spine, and in particular, the intervertebral disc. And so there's a lot of synonyms to this kind of axial back pain that doctors, um, lay people refer this to, um, discogenic back pain, degenerative disc disease, internal disc disruption, black disc disease, disc prolapse. All these kind of help explain the same kind of condition that I refer to as back pain. So it's, um, the pathology is thought to be due to an accelerated disc degeneration or breakdown of that disc material, and it can cause disruptions or alterations in the mechanical and chemical properties of the disc, um, creating or generating pain. So that kind of brings us to this theory that there's these two different things that contribute to the pain. There's a biomechanical theory and a biochemical theory. So if we look at the disc itself and try to talk about the structure of the disc, I like to liken its structure to a jelly donut. And so there's this outer part here. I'm not sure if everyone can see my cursor, but there's this blue area here, which is called the annulus fibrosus, which is like the outside of the donut. And then there's the center, which is a more gelatinous type material called the nucleus pulposus, or like the jelly part of a jelly donut. And the, the disc acts as a shock absorber in our spine, and we have it at multiple levels throughout the, the entire spinal column, the neck, uh, the cervical spine, middle back, thoracic spine, and the lumbar spine. And as we get older, this disc can kind of wear out and cause different uh, sources of pain. So as we get older, without having any kind of disc herniations or any other pathology, we know that the disc goes a certain degree of degeneration. The discs are made up of this, uh, this uh, the, inside the nucleus or the jelly, there are proteoglycans, which act to help attract water and give the uh, disc its shock absorbing quality. And so as we get older, those proteoglycans decrease in quantity, and that means that there's less water in the discs. And so the discs tend to collapse in, in height, and the, the disc is replaced by collagen, which can't act as a shock absorber as well as the water or the proteoglycan. And then this causes dehydration, stiffening of the annulus, and they can't really do its job as a, a shock absorber anymore. And so that kind of leads to this biomechanical theory of back pain, where we have alterations in the disc properties, which cause changes in the motion of each spinal segment. And so you can see that this can cause and lead to excessive motion within the spine. And what that um, inevitably leads to is the generation of other structures that help support the spine. So you get the generation of the facet joints, the ligaments that help support the spine in the back and between these spinous processes, and transverse processes can become strained. You also get strain on the paraspinal muscles that help support the spine. The nerve roots can become irritated. The dura, which is uh, the water balloon that contains all the nerve roots can get irritated. All these things help contributing to the spine and to the, the pain within the spine. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the facet joints as another pain generator. It's another pain generator that we focus on as one that we can potentially treat. And so the facet joint are these little kind of shingle joints in the back of the spine. You have one on each side on the left and the right and at every level. 
And they're a synovial joint, just much like your knee joint or your hip joint. They have cartilage, they have uh, fluid in them, synovium, and then there's also a capsule that surrounds them. And when we have a degeneration of the facetuin, it's much, much like degeneration of the knee, where you get wear and tear of the cartilage, causing inflammation of the joint and causing pain, just like osteoarthritis of the knee. Um, and so uh, this is something that we can target when we're trying to treat pain with different injections. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk, um, which leads me to the biochemical theory of pain. And so in addition to all this degeneration, which causes pain and stimulation of pain, nerve, um, painful uh, nerve endings, um, we also have all these chemicals that are released in response to pain that help kind of transmit the painful signals to your brain. All of these kind of different chemicals, nitrous oxide, phospholipase, phospholipase, prostaglandin, um, all irritate the nerves and can kind of propagate pain. And so we can see that there's this whole mess that's causing pain. There's this wide source of pain in your back. It's coming from multiple different sources. Um, really, we think that the start of this cascade of pain is coming from the generation of the disc, but it's not always just from the disc. It could be initiated at all these other structures that I talked about. So it's unclear if the pain comes from the disc itself or if it's coming from the surrounding structures. So what am I using to help kind of distinguish the painful generators and kind of figure out where the pain is coming from? So in my eyes, it all starts with um, what people complain of. Where is, what, what is the history? What is the patient saying the pain is coming from? A lot of times people complain of this deep, aching lower back pain. Sometimes it kind of comes around the back of their hip bones or into the, uh, the, the gluteal muscles, which are your buttocks muscles. Um, a lot of times people complain of this pain worse with certain types of activity, whether it's flexion of the back or the lumbar spine, or whether it's twisting activities, or simply just the act of getting up from a chair can kind of initiate that pain. Um, and it's really kind of a theory of as we load the back and we load all these painful pain generators, it is exacerbating the pain um, rather than kind of laying down flat or resting those structures. Sometimes people even complain of pain with any prolonged sitting or different positions that kind of exacerbate the pain. Then I usually do a pretty thorough uh, physical exam to test not only the, the back and the back muscles, but also the neurologic structures and the nerves that are exiting the spine. Um, often when people have isolated back pain, discogenic back pain, there's a normal neurologic exam. I don't see any weakness or numbness in the lower extremities. However, as we talked about beforehand, there are multiple sequelae of degenerative disc disease that can lead to neurologic problems. So we can see radiculopathy, irritation of the nerve roots. We can see deformity within the back. And it can even lead to fractures, instability, or there could be other problems that are um, existing at the same time. And so the physical exam really gives me keys uh, as an insight to other processes that might be going on. Next, every patient that walks into my office gets x-rays. Um, it's my way that I can get a snapshot into the back and see what's going on. It gives me some information not only about the alignment of the spine, but also what's going on to all the supporting structures. So most notably, we can see what's going on with the discs. So here's an x-ray of the lumbar spine on the right here. We can see the vertebral bodies, which for the most part look like blocks, and you can see that they're nice and well-structured here in this x-ray. And then there's these spaces in between the blocks. This is where the disc lives. I, I always tell people that I can't see the discs on x-rays, but we can gain a lot of information of what's going on about the disc based on this space. As I talked about earlier, the discs tend to de degenerate over time and they kind of lose their ability to act as shock absorbers. So you can see at this bottom level here, which is L5S1, that space is much less. The bones are right around that area there have become more white or thickened and hardened, which is a response to having not as um, adequate as shock absorbers. And so these are the early signs of arthritis within the spine. On top of that, I like to get bending views to see about the uh, dynamic kind of stability of the spine to see if there's any uh, instability on bending views. Um, but what we see here at the bottom, there, there's actually a low correlation of this x-ray to actual symptoms. And so there's low diagnostic value. It's hard for me to look at an x-ray and point at any one thing and say, hey, look right here, this is your back pain. It just kind of helps me give more data and paint a picture uh, overall of what's going on in the back. Um, I also do on occasions get MRIs on, pa on patients who um, have back pain that doesn't seem to be uh, being treated uh, with some of the early treatment modalities. And what I see with people who have this disc degeneration is um, we can see the structure of the discs. Normal discs, if you look in the far right image, 
have this appearance of black on the outside and kind of white on the inside, much like the jelly donut. The black is the donut part, the annulus, and the white is the jelly, is the shock absorber. And you can see these discs below there have uh, a different appearance. They look more black, they look thinned out. And then the bones, you can see there is actually some changes in appearance of the bones on both of these images. And this kind of um, helps tell us about how advanced the degeneration is. And we have certain um, things that we look for on the, the MRI findings on the different sequences to give us information on that. Um, but is the, MRI, is the MRI telling us the whole story? Can we get, should we get MRIs in everyone? And the answer is no. Um, this was a really famous study done in the 90s where they looked at MRIs on a whole bunch of people, 10,000 people older than 60 years old. And all these people actually didn't have any pain. They didn't have any symptoms. And what they found that about 60% of them had abnormal findings on the MRI. So you, I tell people, if you go digging, sometimes you find something. And whether or not that something correlates with the pain is a big question mark. And so um, I think normal people in the population have these findings like disc herniations or stenosis or disc degeneration, and it doesn't really account to any t degree of symptoms. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily mean it, it doesn't correlate with pain, but I, I, I use the MRI as another piece of the puzzle to kind of paint a picture. Um, another finding that we can look for in MRI is to see if there's anything wrong within the structure of the disc itself. Here we're looking at this arrow here pointing to a little area of intensity with the MRI signifying an actual damage to the disc. This is the tear of the annulus. This actually does have a high correlation with pain in people. And so if I find this, it's something that we can target in our uh, a treatment. So the MRI is a very powerful tool. It gives us a lot of uh, information and de uh, structure about some of the finer details in the spine. Um, and I think it's very important, but it's, it's not an absolute as far as where the pain is coming from. So there's no clear correlation between the MRI and back pain. However, it does a good job at ruling out other things. So people who have normal peering MRIs, I can say with certainty, hey, look, there's nothing abnormal about your structure of the spine. I don't think that the, the pain is coming from any abnormalities within the discs or any compression of the nerve. However, as we see, we, we shouldn't just treat patients solely on the MRI findings. Um, so as you can see, the diagnosis is, is, is difficult for someone like me who spent a lot of time studying the spine and pain generators of the spine. It, it's not a clear picture, and so I, it's confusing to me, so I don't expect it to be a clear for patients to understand either. Um, the imaging modalities are many times nonspecific. Uh, the physical exam is nonspecific. Um, and we really don't have an easy time diagnosing this back pain. So it really brings us to the point is how, do the heck, how the heck do we treat back pain? And so um, I tell people, you know, a lot of times our, our back has all these pain generators and the muscles to kind of take the, the, the brunt of the pain because they're trying to compensate it by holding up our spine. So a lot of the treatment is focusing on treating those muscles. So the things that I like to try early on are, are pain medications. I'm not a huge fan of using or, um, or narcotic pain medications to treat back pain. I don't think it does a good job of actually treating the pain, but it, it does kind of sedate people. So um, I like to use um, NSAIDs, which are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, Motrin, Aleve, uh, Ibuprofen are over-the-counter NSAIDs, but there also are uh, prescription uh, NSAIDs that I like to provide patients. Sometimes muscle relaxants are required, and a short course of uh, steroids sometimes can help as well. Then there are a variety of different injections we can do around the back, not only to help people um, with their symptoms and feel better, but they can also be used as diagnostic values. So we can inject different structures and that can help tell us if certain things are generating the pain. I like to tell people that um, the, the steroids are kind of like happy juice. And if you put the happy juice next to uh, one of the structures that isn't happy, it can make it feel better. And so if I give an injection next to a facet joint that's irritated and people feel better, even if it's for a day, I could say, aha, that's causing the pain. But if you give the injection and they don't get relief, then I'm less likely to think that that is the, uh, the culprit as the pain generator. Um, there are different other tools that we can use, like ablation or rhizotomy or tools where we actually burn different structures to, um, to make them uh, con help control the pain. Physical therapy is at the core of a lot of my treatment um, because, again, the therapy is um, focusing on these muscles of the back that help support the spine. So in, in specific, we're looking at the paraspinal muscles, the core muscles, 
the posterior chain, which includes your gluteal and your, your uh, hamstring muscles. And these are the structures that the therapists really hone in on to help kind of strengthen and support all these structures of the spine. And then there's a lot of um, studies that look into uh, other ways that control pain through uh, therapy. Um, you know, there's a lot of studies that show that pain um, is uh, um, a multidimensional uh, symptom, not just being generated by painful stimulators in the back. There's a lot of a high correlation of pain that um, people who have depression as well. And so people who go for cognitive behavioral therapy or adaptive skills can treat this kind of physical pain as well. Um, bracing, a lot of people like to use braces to treat back pain. Um, I think there's some short-term benefit to get people through painful bouts, but I don't think it's a very um, productive way of treating long-term treating of back pain. Um, it's really used as a crutch. And so as I talked about before, back pain, really the cornerstone of the treatment is focusing on strengthening those muscles of the back to help support all these structures in the spine. The brace kind of takes the work off the muscles and supports the back with a brace. And so it kind of is counteractive of what we're trying to achieve as far as strengthening those muscles. So when people kind of are going through a painful bout, can't back, get back to work, can't go about their daily kind of activities. I think that bracing can help them get through those painful episodes, but it's really not a great long-term solution. Um, so then we start talking about surgery uh, for back pain. Um, and we're trying to figure out, you know, who is a candidate for surgery? Does surgery help people with back pain? Um, and it really, the answer is sometimes. Um, the surgery that we're talking about is really a fusion surgery. So the theory that we have is that there's abnormal motion within the spine that can help contribute to back pain. Um, and a fusion type surgery will help decrease that motion and help relieve the back pain. So the way that I achieve that is I try to um, get the bones to actually fuse together. Um, we do that by putting metal or rods and screws into the bone. And sometimes I use cages to help the bone uh, fused together within the vertebral bodies and here, and then also in the back on the posterior elements where the rods and the screws are. Um, the key is to figure out who is going to be helped by this fusion procedure and does it help people with fusion procedure. And so there have been studies in the spine surgery literature to figure out who it helps and when it does help. And really, it it's, a, it's not as clear of an indication as other things that we do surgery for uh, within the spine pathology. Um, and so fusion surgery for low back pain does help some people. It increases, it improves pain, it decreases overall narcotic uses, and it even helps some people return to work. However, as I was talking about, there's really less success than other reasons for back pain. So other reasons I do back pain, spondylolisthesis is a very confusing word, um, but what it basically means is there's abnormal motion within the spine. So you can see in the middle picture um, that the L5 body has moved forward in relation to the sacrum, and so there's some slippage of that level. On the far right, you can see someone who has a slippage of L4, L5. Um, and I was able to fix that by putting in rods and skew, screws to fuse that level together. And this surgery has a pretty good reputation. It has pretty good results. It, it really helps people in about 80 to 90% of the time. Patients who have fractures or have a, a trauma to them that creates instability of the spine, they require fusion surgeries to help stabilize the spine. And again, this has pretty good track record to help stabilize the spine and get people back to activities that they were enjoying before. Sometimes um, people get cysts within the facet joint. You can see here on the far right, there is a um, big cyst that's pressing on the nerve roots. Um, you can see it here again as well on the um, sagittal MRI. This is a reason, an indication in my eyes for fusion. So the cyst comes from abnormal motion and we talked about that facet joint acting as a synovial joint. And so the cyst is an outpatching of that cal capsule. It's a, uh, um, due to irritation of that facet joint, and it's caused the um, fluid to kind of outpouch and press on the nerves. And so in my eyes, this is an indication for fusion. And then there's deformity, patients who develop uh, compression fractures or deformity from degeneration throughout life. And you can see this patient is punched all the way forward on this x-ray right here. And so we can do surgeries to straighten out the spine and they look really good on x-rays here and I can make patients' spines straight. Um, and, you know, it has a pretty good relief for people who are in dire needs for um, some kind of relief. 
Then there are other reasons for back uh, surgery, including infection, uh, tumors within the spine. These are all reasons to go in there and need to put uh, rods and screws and cages that help stabilize the spine. Uh, but back to back pain, you know, we, we've done study in the literature in the orthopedic world to kind of figure out, does it help? And what we found is kind of. So um, there is a reduction in back pain with surgery. There is reduction in back pain without surgery. Um, we can get people back to work with surgery. We can get people back to work without surgery. Um, and so really, I like to use surgery as a last resort for patients. I think that there are a lot of other modalities that help people get back to back pain. Um, but really, it's trying to figure out who are those people that are candidates for back pain. Um, I like to tell people that I'm a fairly conservative surgeon. Um, I like to um, trial all these other modalities before resorting to surgery. But when people do really have intractable back pain or back pain that isn't getting better with medication, isn't getting better with um, any uh, injections, uh, we've tried other uh, alternative kind of treatment modalities like uh, um, psychosocial uh, therapy or uh, look at uh, different elements of people's life, then yes, surgery is an option. Um, but we really use it as a last resort. And there are other options as well that I think Kelly is going to talk a little bit about. Um, and so uh, I welcome any questions that anybody has about back pain or, or surger, surgery um, that might arise after this talk. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. And so I'll leave you with this picture. Uh, this is me operating with one of my co-fellows in um, fellowship. You can see that we use all these instruments here on the table. We have these lights on our heads to kind of do all the work. And I actually have these little glasses that I wear that are magnifying glasses. And my son saw this picture and thought it'd be funny to recreate uh, becoming a spine surgeon. So here you see a uh, future spine surgeon in the working right there. So uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you learned something from the talk. And uh, we'll, we'll go through questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Um, just a reminder, because some people did come on um, a little bit after we started, there is a chat box in the middle bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, feel free to write them in there and we'll answer them after the presentation. Um, my name is Kelly Allen and I'm a clinical specialist for Abbott spinal cord stimulators. Dr. Beck did mention a little bit about spinal cord stimulators, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about them. Um, probably the next 10 minutes um, will be about spinal cord stimulators. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. Okay. Here we go. So neurostimulation as a pain management option. So what makes a patient a good candidate for spinal cord stimulation? Most likely, patients that have had pain that has lasted longer than the expected healing time, patients that have had limited pain relief from current medications or pain therapies, or patients that have had multiple procedures that have not worked. Spinal cord stimulation, also known as SCS, is a pain management option that works by intercepting pain signals before they breach the brain. To do this, a small system is implanted into the body. When turned on, this implanted system sends mild electrical pulses to nerves along the spinal cord, diminishing the feeling of pain in some cases, simply the absence of pain. Here you can see in this illustration, the red area represents chronic pain in the patient's right leg. As the pain signals make their way up to the brain, the spinal cord stimulator diminishes those messages so that the patients overall feel less pain in those treated areas. You should be able to see that the red area turns from red to blue um, as a representation of the electrical signals making the pain reduce. If your doctor does decide you are a candidate for spinal cord stimulation, you will likely have what is called a temporary evaluation or a trial. This evaluation lets you find out how well you respond to spinal cord stimulation before committing to a fully implanted system. During this evaluation period, you will assess if the stimulation manages your pain throughout the day and during different activities. The, this evaluation period generally lasts about five to seven days. 
So let's talk about this trial period, also known as the spinal cord stimulator temporary evaluation. There are two pain physicians at Plymouth Bay Orthopedics that perform the spinal cord stimulator trial. That's Dr. Turan on the left and Dr. Abraham on the right. This procedure is done right in the office on the first floor at Plymouth Bay Orthopedics, and it is only a day procedure. During this short procedure, you will lie on your stomach, just like having an epidural injection. After the back is cleaned and injected with numbing medication, the doctor will place a temporary wire or lead in the epidural space using a special needle. You may be slightly sedated during this procedure and every step is followed by x-ray. So the picture on the left shows um, the positioning in the procedure in the numbing medication. The picture on the right shows the x-ray in the room and the doctor performing the trial procedure. If you look at this x-ray, you will see the temporary leads that are placed in the area along the spine. That's called the epidural space. I compare these leads or wires to long pieces of spaghetti because that's how small they are. If you look at the x-ray, you'll see small black dots. Those are the electrodes that produce the electrical pulses to prevent pain signals. While in the procedure, testing is done to ensure the leads are placed correctly and the patient gives the doctor verbal feedback. In recovery, patients um, and the representatives will work together to, well, we, the representatives connect the leads to the temporary generator, which will be under a dressing until the end of the trial. So this is what that dressing looks like. This is an image of a patient's back during a spinal cord stimulator trial. Everything is under the dressing and easily hidden under clothing. That's why we call it the invisible trial system. The small gray generator on the left of the slide um, that says SJM, that's an image of what that external generator looks like and that's what's taped under the dressing on the left of that back in that photo. This dressing does stay in place for the duration of the trial until you return to the office in five to seven days. What is the patient's role during the evaluation? The evaluation period is an important time for the patient to determine whether spinal cord stimulation is a good pain relieving option or not. At the end of the evaluation period, the patient should feel comfortable deciding whether or not to move forward with an implanted system. The best way to manage a trial is to complete a thorough and beneficial evaluation by setting realistic goals keeping track of your experiences and following all of the doctor's instructions. So what is considered successful for a spinal cord stimulation trial? At the end of the evaluation, you and your doctor will discuss your experiences with the stimulation and decide whether or not to move forward with an implanted system. Some people feel that their evaluation is successful if, there is pain, if their pain is reduced to a manageable level and they see an improvement in their activity level or function. An example of these improvements could be anything from sitting longer, standing longer, sitting with less pain, standing with less pain, walking for a longer distance, or just walking with less pain overall. At the end of the evaluation period, your doctor will remove the temporary system, whether or not you did well. At this time, you and the doctor will discuss your experiences with the spinal cord stimulator. If a patient does move forward to an implant after a successful trial, a consult with a um, that would be scheduled with Dr. Beck or Dr. Leckie, the implanting surgeons. Implantation of the device is done at the Beth Israel Deaconess in Plymouth, and that is also a day procedure. And that is a different day after the trial. So let's talk about the implant. It is important to know that the implanted system differs slightly from the temporary system in two main ways. The components in each system and which components are, are placed within the body. For the implant procedure, the leads and the generator are placed within the body and nothing is external like in the trial. After the implant procedure, you will receive a small controller to connect to the generator if needed. So if you look at this slide, the pictures on the left 
The first picture is a picture of a wire or a lead. The second picture is a picture of a generator or a battery or an IPG. All those words are interchangeable. It's about the size of a pacemaker. And the controller on the bottom is an iPod. So it's very easy to use. Okay, so now we're looking at an implanted um, procedure. To the left, you're gonna see um, an example of an implanted system where it's zoomed in, where the, spot, the lead is putting it, being put in by the, the surgeon. On the right, you'll see in the middle of the back, the green represents where that lead actually goes in relation to the whole body, right in the middle of the spine. It connects to the generator, which is usually about the lower back or upper buttock area, and all that is under the skin. So this now is an x-ray of that implanted lead. So we just saw what it looks like from the outside on the right. And now we're gonna see what it actually looks like under x-ray. Um, this is a lead that is implanted in the thoracic spine in the epidural space. So this person probably has low back or leg pain. The x-ray is used during the implant procedure to confirm correct placement of the lead or the wire. After the lead is placed, a small incision is then made to place the generator or the battery under the skin. This is usually above or below the belt line. The leads are then connected to the generator under the skin. There is a total of two incisions, the mid back where the lead is or where the lead enters and the upper buttocks or low back for the generator. To conclude spinal cord stimulation, the results of SCS or spinal cord stimulation depend on careful patient selection, successful trial stimulation, proper surgical technique, and patient education. Stimulation does not cure the condition that is causing the pain. Rather, it helps patients manage their pain. SCS is considered successful if pain is reduced at least by half. If you are scheduled for a temporary evaluation, it is important that you prepare certain things prior to the procedure. For example, be sure to plan for transportation for the day of the procedure and determine what tests and insurance approvals are required. The office and the Abbott representatives will make sure that you have completed the psychological evaluation, which is required by everybody, and that the insurance has improved the procedure before for more information about spinal cord stimulation specifically, you can talk to your doctor, an Abbott representative, or visit poweroveryourpain.com. There's actually a lot of information there. If your doctor does deem you as a candidate and you are interested in speaking to someone living with an implanted system, we can connect you to speak with a patient that has an implant. So now we will address any questions from the Zoom chat. I'm going to let Ryan deliver any questions that come from that chat to the group. So we're gonna look at that now. And if you haven't submitted any questions and you want to submit a question, please do so. The, sh uh, the chat button is in the bottom middle of your screen. Kelly, we have four questions that people Great. have asked me on the side. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, Kelly, thank you. And Dr. Beck, thank you very much. Uh, so here, here's the first question for Dr. Beck. Um, I'm assuming it's for Dr. Beck. If I do want to set up an appointment to talk about axial back pain, how long will I have to wait before I can see you, Dr. Beck? So being a new um, physician in the community, one of the advantages is I actually have a lot of openings in my schedule. And so um, I'm in the office usually three days a week, sometimes four. Um, usually it's Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, um, and then sometimes Tuesdays. And then uh, a couple times a month, I'm actually going down to our location in Sandwich. And so we at uh, Plymouth Bay, we have a location in Plymouth uh, on Resnick Road, which is uh, by Colonial Park, um, Industrial Park. Uh, and uh, then I'm go down to Sandwich um, as well. We have a location down there. Um, so when people call, I think they can usually get an appointment within um, 
a couple of days to see me. I'm happy to talk people, even if they've never been evaluated for their back pain before, I think it's a good idea to come in and see me um, um, and talk about the pain to figure out if there's anything else going on, if this is axial back pain. Um, the number to call for our office is 781-934-2400. Uh, and uh, our office, we have a, a, a very good website as well, which is uh, PB ortho.com where we have a lot of information. Um, I think that the team here is actually revamping the website. And so I think we're expecting some new changes and some new resources on the website soon as well. Great. Thank you. Second question for Dr. Beck. If I have back and leg pain, would a fusion device be good for me? Um, it's a possibility. Uh, patients with uh, back pain that's associated with leg pain or sciatic type pain, or the medical term is radiculopathy um, or numbness in the legs, these are all things that I would be concerned about, that there are other things going on other than just the axial low back pain as we discussed. Um, it could be indicative of uh, something that's pressing on the nerves that can contribute to pain going down the legs. There could be other things going on at the same time with uh, other ailments within the hips, the knees, the ankles that can be going on at the same time as back pain. So I think when people tell me they have back pain associated with pain going in the legs, I think that is a, a reason to go see um, a physician uh, or a spine surgeon. Um, uh, depending on what we find, then the surgery is an option. Um, again, um, having uh, pain going into the legs, it could mean that there is radiculopathy uh, which is irritation of the nerve roots, spinal stenosis, which is uh, less space or uh, compression for the uh, spinal canal to compress the nerve roots. Uh, these things generally require uh, a decompression surgery where I actually am freeing up space for the nerve roots. Um, sometimes a, a fusion surgery is indicated, um, sometimes not. It depends on the exact circumstance. And so uh, fusion surgeries are, are, are not for uh, every patient that I see that needs surgery. Sometimes I can uh, perform other types of surgery to help people uh, with pathology or, or problems around the spine. Great, thank you. Uh, next couple questions, I'm assuming are for Kelly Allen, unless you wanna chime in Dr. Beck as well. Um, first question, how long does the pacemaker like battery last? Good question. So it does depend on your settings but the battery can last anywhere around like four to five years. If your settings are very low, um, the battery can last up to 10 years. Um, but pretty typically patients go around the four to five year range. And that leads to the question, what happens after the battery is depleted? So you would go into um, another procedure, um, let's say four or five years after the implant, they would make a small incision where the original battery was placed. They remove the old battery, unscrew it from the wire, put a new battery onto the wire, screw it back on, place it right back where the old battery was, and sew that back up. Um, they don't have to take out the old wire. Um, it's just a battery change. I hope that answers your question. Great. Thank you. Um, and then we do have a couple more questions. Uh, this one, again, Kelly, I'm assuming this question is for the trial procedure. Is it a procedure to take those wires out? So that's also a good question. So you go through the week, you go home, you come back after five to seven days. That's actually an office visit and it's not a procedure. It's very similar to having an IV removed or a catheter removed from your back. So um, if you remember that picture with the dressing on the patient's back, the doctor just takes off that dressing and then just pulls out the leads like a catheter. Um, and then um, they might clean the area and then just put Band-Aids on. You don't have to skip breakfast or anything that you would do for a normal procedure. And you Great. can drive yourself to the appointment as well. Cool. Um, and then the last question, Dr. Beck actually just received. Dr. Beck, why don't you go ahead and sort of uh, ask that question or, or state that question. You can answer that yourself. Sure, yeah. Someone sent me this uh, 
directly through the chat, which I, I checked on. It's actually a really good question, so I'm glad that um, they asked this. So with a diagnosis of spondylolisthesis, how long do you recommend conservative therapies before doing surgery? Is there a limit on the number of epidural steroid injections that can be done? So uh, excellent, excellent question. Um, when, when do we do surgery? So um, for something like uh, spondylolisthesis or back pain or stenosis or whenever someone might be a candidate for surgery, um, when, when do we start talking about surgery? It, it, it's extremely variable. Um, and for the most part, it's something that um, is really individualized to each person. Um, I really let people decide where that tipping point is. Um, really at the most, I see patients maybe twice or three times before we start talking about surgery, which really isn't that much for me to get to know somebody and their personal preferences. Um, some people are scared of surgery and don't want to ever partake in surgery. And some people um, are more likely to kind of pursue a surgical treatment. It's, it's really a personal choice. And so um, I kind of let um, people be their own litmus test um, when they've had enough of any one therapy and they want to try something else, whether that would be um, abandoning therapy and going to injections or abandoning injections and going to therapy. Um, people really kind of have a good gauge on when they're ready to try something. And it's my job as, a, as the surgeon to kind of explain the benefits and risks of every decision and kind of weigh the pros and cons of every decision um, to give everyone all the tools they need to make those decisions. Um, is there a limit on the number of epidural injections? The answer is kind of. It's uh, really dependent on the person who's doing the injections here at Plymouth Bay Orthopedics. Uh, that would be Dr. Turan and Dr. Abraham are the ones who are actually providing the injections. Um, usually we don't like to give too many steroid injections because the steroids can kind of have some downside effects as well. They can make people prone to some kinds of infections. Um, it can uh, create some degeneration or kind of a atrophy of the muscles that surround the injections. Um, so we really like to limit those to maybe three or four epidurals a year. So once every three months or so is pr probably the max. Um, but moving forward after that, these can be used long-term to, to treat pain if people want to continue with injections. Um, the downside with them, I do warn people that the injections tend to work less and less with every subsequent injection, but sometimes um, people can get injections long-term over years, uh, a couple times a year to help control their pain. Great. Um, Kelly, Dr. Beck, I have no more questions, so I'll leave it. Uh, I'll I leave see it. one more um, uh, question here in the- Oh, good. I didn't see that. Sorry. It says, what are the risks associated with having the device? Um, and so when the final device is implanted, Kelly, I think uh, I can answer this one if you have Thank anything. Thank you. Um, it's, it's like anytime we put anything else within the body. And so uh, we're only implanting that final device uh, after we've done the trial and we could be sure that it is uh, working or providing relief. The downsides are anytime we put in any kind of implant into anybody, whether that's a hip replacement, uh, a spinal fusion, um, a knee replacement, uh, we're putting something into the body and so that people can have infections after a surgery. Um, there is that battery pack that kind of goes right around uh, the lower back, uh, around the waistline. We try to put it in a position that doesn't irritate people when they're sitting, doesn't irritate them with their clothes or wearing a, a pants or a belt line. Uh, but on occasions, it does irritate people and it, it does need to be removed. Um, uh, the there are chances that things go wrong with the procedure itself when we put the final implant. You know, most of my spine surgeries can be done safely. I wouldn't recommend doing them for people if I don't think they can be done safely. But every surgery, there are risks involved. And those are things, details that we talk about um, as we kind of um, go through the consent for the procedure. So hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, it's kind of a broad answer to the question. Kelly, do you have anything to add? No, I think you answered that well. Um, I usually defer that question to the doctor anyway, so thank you. Um, and then I see another question here that someone sent me privately, which is fine, um, so I'm gonna read it out loud. Someone else was diagnosed with a syndrome called Bertolotti syndrome, uh, I'll explain what that is, after I had an acute attack of lower back pain. In doing research, it seems this is a somewhat fairly rare condition. Do you see many cases of this? Um, the answer is, uh, yeah, this is something that I've come across in my training. 
um, I've come across in my private practice. Um, it, it is a less common cause of back pain, but it kind of goes along with some of the things that we talked about in, our, uh, in my talk um, as different generators of back pain. Uh, a Bertolotti syndrome is a congenital uh, um, anomaly or variation uh, where part of the spine is actually fused together on its own. And um, it's either fused completely or partially fused. And this kind of partial fusion creates kind of two bony surfaces rubbing on each other that can create the back pain. Um, there are a lot of different things that we can do to help treat this condition, uh, including injections. And then even a surgical management would be actually, instead of uh, a fusion procedure is an option, but the way that I prefer to try to, to, to avoid fusion is kind of remove that fusion. And so I end up going in there and I kind of uh, that area where things are rubbing, I go in there and I kind of remove some of the bone so it gives more space um, and can allow uh, that pain to not kind of recur. Uh, a fusion procedure is, is an option. It's something that I would consider as, as a resort if the injections, the uh, decompression surgery don't work. Um, but again, Bertolotti syndrome, it's something that uh, is rare, um, but uh, you know I'm knowledgeable about it and I'm fairly comfortable treating. So I think it would uh, definitely warrant an evaluation by a spine surgeon. Any more questions? If, um, if there were any questions that weren't addressed, um, you can still send them while we're on here, but feel free to call Dr. Beck's office. I'm actually gonna, share my screen and put up um, that information so you have it. Give me one second here. So if you have to reach Dr. Beck in his office at Plymouth Bay Orthopedics, the number is here, 781-934-2400. If you had specific questions about spinal cord stimulation, um, you can either email me here at kelly.allenabbott.com or call my cell phone, 781-718-5019. Um, Ryan, are you seeing any more questions in here? I am not, Kelly. That's, that's all I have in here. So okay. Thank you, everyone, for okay. the questions. So um, this um, now concludes tonight's presentation. So thank you, Dr. Beck, for coming on here, and thank you for everyone that did participate in this call. Um, you will receive follow-up about this meeting with information on how to reach Dr. Beck to schedule an appointment. Um, that information is also included if you received a packet in the mail before um, this presentation. Um, but thanks again for joining. I hope you got something out of this and have a good night. Thank you, everybody. We usually like to do these talks and provide dinner for everybody. Uh, unfortunately, we <laughs> the current circumstances we weren't able to so i, I really appreciate everyone um uh, uh joining yanks thanks dr beck thanks dr beck thanks, everybody. thanks kelly oh.